Lee Hall is a Pennsylvania-based environmental law specialist and writer, author of On Their Own Terms, Animal Liberation for the 21st Century, and creator of the Studio for the Art of Animal Liberation on Patreon. Lee has been vegan since 1983 and a lifelong advocate connecting veganism with ecology and animal liberation. Thank you so much for being here today, Lee. Oh, it's so exciting to be with you. It's been years since we did this. It's so. been a long time, yes. I, it's wonderful to be able to connect like this, especially in these times. I'm interested. I'm not sure I even have ever heard your journey to veganism way back in 1983. A lot has changed since then in the world. Yes. Um, back then, when I first became vegan, I didn't know any other vegans uh i had never heard the word before and so what was going on all the time was i had to explain what it meant to be vegan which i guess is kind of a good thing in a way uh because i was doing it all the time uh, but the first vegan i ever met who uttered the word the first time was the one who in that conversation persuaded me to become a vegan so I would say a lot has changed since then. And it's good to think about that because we, veganism really is uh, coming into its own. Uh, there are very few people now that we meet in most places who don't know of it. There are very few restaurants or grocery stores where we can't get help finding things. So, yeah, that brings hope. It does indeed. And well, I'm curious, what did the person say to convince you to be vegan on the spot like that? Uh, well, it was a conversation that actually lasted a couple of hours. Um, I was at a rock concert, and the point was to actually see the music, <laughs> hear the music, be there. Uh, it was this band I really liked. In fact, I liked them so much that somebody, I knew that I couldn't afford to go see this conference, paid for it. So. That's how important it was to me to be at this concert. But I saw some leaflets. I There was a leaflet on my chair, and there were leaflets on all the other chairs, it seemed, in the entire auditorium. So I picked it up and read it. And it was about the mainly about the coming holiday season and all the various ways that humans would be using animals for this season. And I mean, you know, from fur coats to puppies as gifts to what or who would be on the table, goose and ducks and so forth. And since there's so many different ways that animal use was described in this pamphlet, and as I was reading them all, I realized that I had somehow engaged in every one of them in some on some level or I'd certainly seen them all the, and uh, you know funny or not funny haha but I had never thought of those things as expo I don't know why I never thought of those things as outrageous um, I identified myself as a feminist so I think that to me, what a feminist means is it means a rejection of one's status in a master class. It's very simple, and I object to that. I don't want to be in that. In that, I don't want anybody. I don't want to be on either side of that oppression, and that was a core value of mine. So to realize at this moment that I had been part of a master class all my life you know, 21 years, and never really examined that. And so during the course of this conversation, I mean, I said that to Robin Lane, who, who was the person I met. We're still friends. Uh, Robin, um, for, for several years, be, began the London Vegan Festival, so had a, a lot of influence throughout Europe. Uh, bringing vegan festivals into the in, what's well, now the mainstream. This is a thing, you know, but at the at that time it was unique. And so I said that. I said, you know, Robin, 
I don't think I can continue to call myself a feminist. But if I do, then I better listen to what you have to say because I'm going to be changing my life tonight. Cool. Will you, would you help me? And Robin said, yeah, well, we'll go and look in your fridge and we'll do a shopping trip. And Robin visited me at work and, you know, we just, we had this friendship based on uh, my learning a, a lot very quickly. <laughs> that was an awesome story. What a great story. And, and that you're still friends all this time later. That's wonderful. And and nowadays you're also identifying, um, self-identifying as non-binary. And this is also something that's coming into the mainstream vocabulary. And I'll admit that I don't really know a lot about it um, on the surface. It sounds completely reasonable to me. Um, but perhaps you could enlighten me as to what what, what is this? Yeah, and uh, some feminists, particularly when I first when the when the, I first started thinking of this concept and realizing that it resonated, um, some people in the feminist community would say, "Well, is that not erasing female female identity?" Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I learned. I learned that. Actually, for a long, long time, intersex people were being erased because there's this dual idea of either or male or female. And because people who were born intersex didn't exactly fit either side of that, um, many people have had to force themselves into a role and even um, undergo genital mutilation before the, they could possibly be at an age that they could consent to that, often as, as babies. So, and now society is realizing that that is a human rights violation, and the UN has recognized that. So that's one thing, that where it, uh, erasure is perspective. Uh, but... Then I have to say that non-binary inter intersex are not the same thing. They might overlap, but they don't always interlap. Non-binary is not about sex so much as it is about gender and the performing of gender. If we have the ability to perform a gender that is whole, for example, to consider oneself the product of, of a mixed sex marriage, right? Father on one side, mother on the other side, and we are a whole person, right? So uh, that would leave a lot of people free to perform their identities uh, in a way that doesn't constrict them unfairly. Uh, and it also non-binary challenges this idea that there's a borderline defining people on one side or the other. And so that resonated, um, that I deeply, you know, that is a, a core part of who I am, uh, that I'm asking serious questions about these categories that we have been living in all this time and asking for uh, more uh, freedom and more more uh, uh, potential to live who we are completely. I've also thought about it in terms of the animal liberation context because I think, for example, I think of myself as a primate. I'm not really on only one side of a human-animal divide. We hear the term humans and animals all the time. Um, but really, it's not like that. We are part of the animal sphere, the animal world. And the idea that, we're, that there's this borderline between us is really what allows people to experiment on animals, including other primates, because there's this false category of us and them. So to me, it's a, it's a holistic question. 
and it goes even beyond our our roles as humans, our performance as um, as genders. It also goes to our performance as human, and going beyond that. Mm-hmm. As complete holistic uh, spiritual beings. Um, I, I'm thinking back to what you said in the beginning about the dominance of, um, you know, as a feminist, you reject the hierarchical dominant culture, either male dominated or female dominated. You don't want to be a part of that. I believe that's what you're saying. And um, it seems to me that a non binary identification would, would never allow for any kind of dominance or power over because we we've we've erased that that boundary yes yes exactly and for example uh gay marriage could never have been banned because the idea that there were two separate classifications of people would become absurd so it would free a lot of people uh, going into gay marriage, another borderline that has separated many, many people from living up to their full potential and being with those they love for their for lifetimes, is the idea that uh, none. And and Canada has been very helpful uh, to people who have wanted to become uh, wanted to enter same sex marriages, but needed to cross a border to live with the person that they loved. The United States didn't allow the non-citizen to come and join the person they wanted to get married to. And so they would have to live their life separate, or many people moved to Canada because it was accepted for many years. So, yeah, these ideas of borders oftentimes take away everything that's meaningful to us. So that's what our identity is it's the the ability to live up to our full potential and follow all the pathways we love okay so i have to ask though on behalf of a friend of mine who is um a person concerned about this erasure of the feminine and feminist um liberation and and all of that and her great fear is that Apparently, um, the, the, it comes down to the bathroom situation that there are people now who she says will just identify as as female and go into this uh, female bathroom, and um, and then it's terrifying for women, and especially um, women who are escaping abusive relationships and just want a woman only space. How you know? How do you uh, how do you respond to those concerns? Well, it may be better to have, for example, um, I, I don't know, you know, I, there are theaters in Pennsylvania, in, in Philadelphia, there are theaters all over North America where they have uh, non-gendered, non-binary restrooms. And there are really enough people going in and out of them that they're safe because of that. Um, you, you could find a lack of safety, no matter what the situation was. If you had only a specific female bathroom, that doesn't keep unsafe people, you know, people who would do harm. But I think that that, uh, the idea that trans people would be more dangerous, I I think is is false. Yeah, it seems to me that um, that dominance of a a gender over another gender is, again, part of this divide, that it's a self-identification of I'm this identification and therefore I have the power over this other identification. I don't know. But as you say, there's always going to be people who do crazy things. And and that really, I I think, perhaps you're saying, shouldn't prevent us from Shouldn't, we shouldn't just be afraid. We should find solutions that, that work. Exactly. Exactly. And getting back quickly to what you said before about um, was I meaning that we don't want male or female dominated situations. I would agree with that. Um, what I was pointing out is that I don't want to be on in either tier, either the 
dominator or the person who's being oppressed. So there is a liberation from both of those identities that's important. And to me, veganism was that. It was taking the feminist principle that we don't want to be oppressed and we don't want to be oppressors, that both of those are restrictive and harmful. So we want to liberate ourselves from, from those roles. And veganism was a natural for me once I realized that it, it, it was a trajectory of my femi feminism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and we're seeing now that there's, um, there's another major shift happening. Um, you know, veganism, I think, was on the rise as people were becoming educated about their own health and the planetary health and the plight of the animals. But now we're seeing um, the, the virus outbreaks inside the slaughterhouses and what they're calling packing plants. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering if people aren't going to have to become uh, vegan and, um, and with concern, of course, for the people who are working in, in those environments who are now sick in the, in the hundreds and thousands. Um, I'm wondering if you want to comment on that. Yes, uh, because I think that when COVID-19 first came out and, and to some extent still, what we're hearing is a lot of the assignment of the responsibility on the wet markets. And we're certainly hearing that in North America, that from a lot of high profile influencers, that we really have to shut the wet markets down, that that's the issue. And in truth, it's not just a pointing fingers at somebody else that's going on here. There are Chinese people who would like to shut down the wet markets as well. Um, there is uh, notably uh, the, the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. Uh, they are pressing for a wet market ban. And what's notable about this is that not only are they doing it because of health reasons, but they also want to shut down wet markets because of respect for the animals and conservation. So that's going on in China. So there's a lot of outcry about the wet markets, but it's not just the wet markets. That's the issue. And you bring this up. We have, uh, there's, whenever we cut into nature, whenever we impose ourselves on other living communities, whenever we have animals living in close confinement with poor hygiene, uh, or close confinement, even you know, out, outside, it's you're still they're under uh, control. They're not being they're not part of a natural bio community, and you do get uh, diseases. You do get sicknesses from these, and so you know we've got all the other kinds of diseases, kind of pandemics that we know of in history, and typically the threat is not that they're simply from wet markets, but the, the, thre the thread, the common thread, is the use of animals, the exploitation, and oftentimes it's the cutting into nature. We're finding out more and more, science, science is finding out that uh, cutting into forests is releasing diseases. So there are a lot of interfaces between human beings and other, part, other living communities that we need to look at here. And so the question is, can we, I think of quarantine now in terms of the, uh, unfortunately, I think this is temporary, but the, the advantage that the free living animals are having right now, because we're quarantining ourselves from nature to a great extent, and they're able to live in some semblance of, of, of freedom right now the deer and the birds and the, the uh, foxes and the coyotes and so forth. They're out there uh, partying, you know, they're, they're really <laughs> living. And so I kind of like, you know, the, the other side of this coin of being released from quarantine is, hmm, uh, there's, there's some aspect of this that maybe we would want to keep. So, yeah, I'd like to see some self-isolating of humanity from, from those intrusions of nature. 
the birds are singing in agreement. <laughs> I can hear them. Yes. Yeah. Um, certainly, we don't need to all hop back in our cars, perhaps right away. I, I'm hoping that there's a lot of things that we can be thinking about as we're as we're living like this. And I and I think people are. We're hearing about the pollution levels going down and that sort of thing. At the same time, though, the animal agriculture sector. Um, is trying to keep on going, although we're hearing now about the closure of slaughterhouses um, uh, because the workers are infected, and um, and and that's raising a lot of questions about the what's called food coming out of there, and also the fact that I find it interesting that um, you know now there's a surplus of milk, for example, because the schools are closed and the restaurants are closed, so. Instead of um, distributing this, um, what's called food, to people who are hungry, the, because they can't make any money off of it, it's all just going down the drain. So there's a lot of things going on right now. I really like in your book, I have an earlier version of your book, but I'm, I'm sure this is a, a philosophy that carries on into the current release, is, is it, there's sort of two different areas of animal liberation you talk about, and one is the is re, in regard to the wild creatures about l letting them live on their own terms, and 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 how we approach uh, that as a movement versus how we approach the um, domestication of horse breeding and exploitation of animals in domestic use. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yes. Uh, as far as domesticated animals, I think that the eco-feminist theory of the ethic of care uh, works, if you will, because the question is, uh, how do we rescue animals who have been uh, domesticated, who have been born into a dependent life? And so we rescue you know, whether it be farm sanctuaries or whether it be the animals that we've brought into our homes from the pet trade. Uh, they're basically refugees from various kinds of businesses. And they cannot live on their own terms because of what has happened with them through selective breeding throughout the generations. So for them, uh, the, the feminist ethic of care works. Uh, it's appropriate. And I would say animal welfare is appropriate, but taken seriously in the situation where they're truly cared about. The, the welfare, the well-being of animals is important, and we need to focus on it and extend it to animals who depend on us. There is another, I think these are two different threads that we need to look at in two different ways. There is another world of non-human beings out there, and those are the ones who live untamed, who have never been domesticated. So the coyotes and the deer and the wolves and the caribou. Uh, they, they, re they require from us philosophically and in the way we live our lives, something different. And I used to call it animal rights. But the more I thought, in fact, I, in, the, in the earlier uh, writings that I did, and I think the book you have, even in the subtitle, I use the term animal rights, because I thought, it, I thought of animal rights as a firm, uncompromising word to represent how important respect is. And I do think that to the extent we can get, formulate animal rights for some animals, wherever they may be, whoever they may be, we should do it. But my concern is that say we sort of extend animal rights to parrots, right? And we do it on the basis of their ability to count and think. Then have we really respected them on their terms? Or have we applied some sort of intelligence test to them? 
And have we said that we're going to have guardianship for them so that we're really what we're doing is just applying a different kind of ethic of care to them. We're not, we're looking at, okay, we're going to extend these rights to apes and sanctuaries, extend this personhood. Well, okay, if they have to be in captivity, but isn't the question because they can't, because they're dependent at this point, right? And they couldn't fend for themselves. Okay. But if we really want to talk about respect, um, there's a third term that I think we need to use, and I've adopted it now as my goal. And that's animal liberation. And that's the idea that we really can't bestow anything on them. We really can't grant them, give them rights. They have, their birthright is a free life on their own terms. And so these other animals who are untamed, it's very important that we care about defending their habitat, that we care about controlling ourselves so that we don't make further inroads, impositions on that habitat, so that we figure out ways to respect them rather than control them. So those are kind of the the distinctions I make with those three terms. And um, just this morning, I was mentioning to you that I've received an article um, from the Narwhal, a great Canadian alternative press, um, concerned that Coastal Gas Link, which is one of the pipeline companies, working in the northern uh, British Columbia right now, ongoingly through this pandemic, they are now wanting to pay people to kill wolves in the endangered caribou habitat. Um, What do you know about culls and and this attempt to try to, for humans to try to control animal populations in the wild? We, We have experience with this already. Yes. And in fact, in the United, in the Western United States, this has been going on for so long um, with both ranching and the pipeline issue, where this idea that we should be moving free living animals out of the way, whether they be elk or uh, wolves, and uh, you know, it's it's um, it's sprawl. Uh, a lot of times, you hear this idea that the problem is big egg big animal egg. Uh, the problem is factory farms. But that's not the, the whole problem. The whole problem is the exploitation in any form, in any setting. And the, the so-called more free roaming commodified animals are, the more they're roaming over the habitat of others. So what you supposedly give to commodified animals, right? More space, more room, the West, the grazing in the West. You're, it, it's a zero sum game. There's only a certain amount of earth to go around. And so to the extent that we have animals grazing uh, supposedly freely, uh, we don't, you know, we're taking away. Uh, we're killing the, uh, the carnivores. So it's, yeah, it's all about whether for pipelines, for the, the animal agribusiness industry, this is about we're taking habitat and it's for commerce and that's very important. Um, so what other animal communities are doing with their lives just isn't as important as getting this oil. That's what it comes down to. So... You know, this is one of the things we really need to think about in the future when we're talking about how to come through the pandemic with some style and grace and dignity as as human, as the human ape community. You know, how are we going to come through this? And veganism really speaks to how we want to be as human apes, as moral apes. Uh, can we live a low carbon life? Can we Can we say we don't need what that pipeline is bringing? Uh, can we live a resource frugal life? Can we transcend the culture of confinement and commodification of other living beings? Can we learn to share the prosperity that we take at the Earth's expense? Can we learn to share the prosperity that we have and thus undoing the incentives for us all to extract and store more and more and take profits? Because 
Janine, uh, real affluence, the word affluence means flow. And real resilience means that we, as human beings that are part of a greater bio community, really need to start asking some deep questions about why these modern crises emerge in the first place. We need to be become whole. We need to become, we need to renew ourselves and understand ourselves as part of this bio community and not above it and not just takers. Certainly, this is a very humbling experience uh, for us. The, this this tiny virus has 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 shown us so much about ourselves and continues to do so. I like what you say in the the book that that I've got. You say that we need to envision the world we want to live in. We can't achieve what we don't conceive. It seems like now is a good time to to imagine yeah. that world. Yeah, absolutely right. What do we want? I mean, you know, we keep thinking about what we want to go back to, but what do we maybe want to preserve about the simplicity that we have right now? So one way of getting there, it seems, I love your idea of dietary divestment. There's a lot of talk about uh, divesting from the oil and gas industry and the war machine, and all of those movements have had some success and uh so perhaps now we can introduce dietary divestment how does that work yes well um dietary divestment we have divestment campaigns that are well known uh oftentimes coming from the quaker community and the unitarian universalist community and these groups are saying you know we're going to divest from war we are going to divest from fossil fuels we are going to take those stocks out of portfolios. We are going to ask schools to take those stocks out of their portfolios. Um, we're going to ask our banks and so forth uh, to divest from these earth wrecking and people harming industries. And so it's a, it's a, it's a great idea to have uh, people come together and decide uh, that uh, we're going to divest from things that we don't want to see in the future and in invest in those things that are really the best in us. So I'm thinking about the idea of dietary divestment because, you know, here we are and we're burning fossil fuels and we're cutting down trees and we're farming land and we're breeding animals and all this is causing tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide to go up into the atmosphere. And that is creating a blanket effect, a greenhouse effect. And what that leads to is that global temperatures right now are, on the average, higher than they've been any time in the past 10,000 years. So the question then becomes, well, how much of the greenhouse gas effect comes from animal farming. If we divest from animal farming, will this be a big deal as far as changing uh, our effect on the climate? A lot of scientists, I mean, the broad consensus right now is around a fourth of the greenhouse effect is caused by animal agribusiness. Uh, some experts have said that is quite a bit more, but even if you were to say, yes, it's a fourth, well, that's a very big deal. So if we have the power, the personal power, to divest from this industry, well, we could actually really get a lot done. I live in Pennsylvania, um, in this area, uh, in Chester County, Lancaster County, our, our surrounding area. We have a lot of dairy farms. And it turns out that because the summers are getting hotter and hotter, the dairy farmers are trying to figure out if they want to install air conditioning or water sprayers. So they're moving the cows inside. The free ranging thing isn't working anymore because what happens is the cows that are really cows who get really hot can't produce a lot of milk. So the farmers are trying to figure out how to further intensify the the cows into into uh, into places where they can be cooled down. And it's so absurd because 
the cows, the cow farming, the dairy farming is what's causing a lot of the problem in the first place. And yet they're trying to figure out how to cool the cows down. Um, there is a better idea than that. You know, we can we can mobilize through a dietary divestment campaign and it can be done through the level of personal pledges so that we make individual commitments to divest our own dietary portfolio from the products of animal agribusiness. By the way, I use the term animal agribusiness because I reserve the word agriculture for those who like the veganic farmers who are growing plants for people to eat. I think culture makes sense when we're talking about such such folks, such work. Um, but animal agribusiness is basically done because, you know, it's more profitable. If you were to walk into any grocery store, where are the most expensive items, right? We know where they are. You can do, I mean, some folks have said that uh, eating vegan is elitist or expensive, but it's really not. It just depends on what kind of vegan food you're going to get. Are you going to get a lot of processed foods and fancy packaging? Might be a little bit more expensive, not much. But, uh, you know, or are you going to do a lot of, of cooking on your own and do a lot with uh, lentils and, and beans and peas and so forth? So it depends on how you go about this. So there's the, the, uh, the level of divestment that's on a personal level from animal agribusiness, right? And then there's also the calling on different, you know, uh, just like the Quakers do uh, with, the, with the divestment from fossil fuels, going to schools, right? And, and having, asking the schools to divest and so forth. Anytime we're, we're doing any outreach or going to give a presentation at a university, for example, are we talking to the people who work with the dining services and specifically on the day we're there, you know, are we making sure that nothing uh, on the table uh, fails to reflect the, the, what we want to see in the world? Mm -hmm. And the, and the power of the personal divestment I think is is huge, and, and even more than uh, choosing to give up your car. I, I think that's scientifically solid, is it not? Well, it giving up the car can be difficult, particularly for example, like the uh, grocery store across the street. A lot of folks cannot afford to live near the grocery store across the street where they work. So they come from other areas to work in the grocery store. You see what I'm saying? There are a lot of people who can't get to where they need to work. They're essential workers, right? Right. But they have to commute to get there. So it can get complex with saying, you know, I'm not going to have a car. And particularly in, in a lot of the areas we are where there's, there's, we haven't really built up public transport the way we need to. So that needs to be done, but that's going to take some time, and I'm totally for it. I mean, we need to, we need to work on trains. But um, today, I mean, the first time we hear the word vegan, the first day or night we hear the word vegan, we can actually embrace it. We can actually become it. Isn't that wonderful? And I think really most of the change, the significant change we've always had socially has always come from the grassroots. And, and, and actually, and what I was saying is that um, I appreciate that there are people who need their vehicles. Um, and and um, I hope that people who who don't need to drive them all the time are realizing that that as well that it's nice to go for a walk sometimes. But what I'm what I'm really saying is that it's it's actually um, more powerful, as I think you are saying too, to choose the vegan path. You can hang on to your car, but if you make that vegan solution um, for yourself, that's actually more powerful than giving up your car for in, in environmental terms. Um, well, I think the real advantage to it is how fast it can be done mm. from a, you know, from a practical standpoint. Um, it, it just right now, logistically, 
it's so hard for so many people to give up their car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it, it is something that we, that's powerful that we can do today. You can and do it. We, we all can do it. It's a matter of saying, okay, I really want this. I really want to do it. It's going to make a big difference. I can start today. And hey, there's a lot of vegan, there's a lot of vegans out there today. It's easy to do. You can actually have really, really good gourmet food if you want. You know, that you're not really losing anything, you're gaining everything, and you're not doing anything that's really logistically hard. Certainly not in this day and age. You know, this is veganism is very possible to embrace immediately. So I think both of those things, right? I think not driving as much as possible. Um as you said, to the extent that, that those who do not need to drive. Maybe maybe take local hikes instead of drive to the next mountain, right? Maybe appreciate more what's right around our area. That's all important. Um, so I think both sides are really important. Mm -hmm. Both um, to not taking that stuff out of that, those pipelines that's wrecking the habitat is really important. Uh, and so as is dietary divestment from animal agribusiness. I think they both are. I just think that going vegan is something that's easier to do right now. Right. And when we go vegan, we do it really for the animals. Uh, the, the fact that it's beneficial to the environment is, is also important. But ultimately, as a vegan, I feel, uh, you know, it, it comes down to it's not fair to the animals. Um, and then it's just awesome that it's good for the environment, too. But I guess what's going on in the back of my mind is um, in a lot of environmental activism communities, they they really don't want us to think on a local level. They don't want, it's, it's not about us making the, all the sacrifices. I've heard this argument that mm -hmm. we shouldn't have to sacrifice our lifestyle. We need governments to divest. We need um, alternative energy options. You know, we need um, decisions to be made at a higher level um, to retrain workers away from pipelines and onto solar panels or, or that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. I personally feel like the power of the individual collectively is huge. And I think the fact that the price, you could have been paid $37 yesterday for a barrel of oil <laughs> is an indication of the power of individuals. But I guess, I guess perhaps we, and maybe you agree with this too, is we need to work on both levels but the most important thing we can do right now every day is to divest personally from those um, dietary choices that are oppressing animals. Yes. Well said. Everything you just said. Um, I, would go, I would go back to um, the reason that we're vegan, like the primary reason that we're vegan. And I would say like when I started, when I became vegan, it was because of oppression. So yes, it's absolutely for the animals. Um, the more... I am, you know, the more years I live as a vegan, the more I realize that my health is super, super important to everything I do. So I can't really unravel my health from all, you know, whatever is important to me. It's like integral that I have my health to be able to do my activism and that other people have the best health that they can have so that they can reach their full potential. And when we're looking at the environment, um, and I think part of this comes from realizing that there's a lot that we need to do for animals who are untamed, that, that there's a lot that we need to change about the way we live to respect animals' ability to keep living in the environment. And so when we make the decision not to eat animals, not to breed animals into existence, not to oppress animals who would have been living a domesticated, dominated life. We're also freeing habitat. And we're also taking a stand against the, the oppression and the forced domestication of those animals in the first place. So it becomes really interwoven. You, you see what I'm saying? The whole the idea of Veganism for the animals, veganism for social justice and, and hunger, you know, food security, and veganism for the environment and veganism for our health. If this is one of the things that's so beautiful about it, is that the more years you are one, 
the more you realize, oh, I love all these things. I love all these things. This is such a great idea that I had back then. I'm so glad I took the chance right then when I did. Absolutely. Um, I just like to mention that uh, the Food Revolution Summit is coming up. I think it's the ninth annual with John and Ocean Robbins. Uh, for people who maybe are interested in the health aspects, they focus specifically on the health component of it. And I think they have 25 different speakers this year, doctors, plant-based doctors, nutritionists. It starts, I think, this weekend, April 26th till May 2nd, something like that foodrevolutionsummit.org. I'll just plug that because I, I listen every year. It's fantastic. They, they have a, a lot of new research every year, uh, science-based research on the health. So while we're talking about um, science-based things, I'm concerned about the vaccine. I, I think it's going to be very important for us to have a vaccine against this COVID uh, virus. But um, you know, I've talked to other people who say, oh, yeah, well, they're using lab animals. And I think you're suggesting they might even be using primates to test the virus. Yes, uh, they are. Um, it, it really becomes bizarre that we are looking to find a solution to a disease that comes from what we think is a zoonotic disease. Um, we believe that it's because of the trafficking of animals that we have COVID-19. So we're trying to find a solution by trafficking animals into labs. It's really weird. Uh, it, the experiments that are going on in Pittsburgh to find a vaccine there, University of Pittsburgh are uh, going on with mice and I, you just have to ask: Is there? Can't we transcend exploitation? Can't we? Can't we get to the root of why these crises happen, which is exploitation and trafficking like this? Um, in some other COVID news, the the Daily Beast came out with a report that there's a deal between the NIH and purveyors of non-human primates that's worth almost $2 million to get to procure these primates for the National Institutes of Health in the United States. So, yeah, um, it's like we're missing something. It's like we're not learning something. This is a zoonotic disease, and what are we doing? We are buttressing, bolstering the industry that supplies animals to labs, whether purpose breeding them or whether taking them out of habitat. Uh, this is the stuff we have to learn to stop doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, we can go on and on and find vaccine after vaccine, but if we haven't looked at the root of the issue, which is how we're living among a, within a full bio community, and realizing that we need to become respectful members of that bio community, then we're just going to do this over and over and over. We haven't, we haven't found a solution. There's going to be another. We're we're living in in the time of climate change, and one thing we know about climate change is it causes new vectors to move of, of, of disease, new 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 vectors of viruses to move in different ways that we can't predict. We don't know what climate change is going to bring up. Uh, uh, we know it's going to bring up a lot. What are we going to do then? We seem to be very flustered right now. We don't know how to respond. So um, I guess that's my question really is going deeper than, oh, we need a vaccine. We need something deeper than that. But the vaccine, we may find a vaccine. We may not find a vaccine. There may be no vaccine that works for COVID-19. Regardless, there are going to be more diseases. Uh, certainly, if we continue to exploit animals, there's definitely exactly. going to be war and worse uh, diseases, is what they're saying. I love your philosophy. I think if we're not grounded in some kind of a philosophy as a human species at this point in our evolution, you know, then we have some serious thinking to do. So one place that people can get more involved is at your uh, Patreon platform, The Art of Animal Liberation. What, what's that all about? 
Yes, well, I, I started a studio uh, for the art of animal liberation on Patreon. So it's patreon.com slash Lee Hall. And the idea of working through the studio is that it's a matter of how does a writer, how does an educator, how does an artist, how does an activist do work without a brand name? Without, you see what I'm saying? With How do we do independent work? If we're going to do um, work that is independent of institutional support, whether that be school or nonprofit or commercial, um, we're not doing it with that support. So then how do we do the work? And Patreon has come up with a wonderful idea. It harks back to the idea of patrons of the arts. Um, and this is kind of a crowdfunded patronage system, but it's it's not a Kickstarter. It's not just a crowdfunder. It is a constant. The, the, the patrons are constantly not only supporting the work, supporting the effort, but they're also becoming part of the work month after month. So uh, I work very closely with an activist in Texas, Chris Kelly, who I know, who I've known for many years, who inspires me to constantly do critiques on a uh, pet keeping and the idea that there's this ideal of if we treated every animal like pets right we'd be doing great so chris always pushes me uh to deal with the cuteness right the cute memes and so forth and the and the, the idea that if we hug animals that we're treating them fairly um i met several people in johnstown at the annual vegan summer fest that happens in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. So Jack McMillan, uh, Bill Drellis, Yonea Tomsic, Pam Page. These are folks that I've known for many years. And so we've come together now. Uh, they're supporting my work. They want to see it happen. But more than that, they're, they're part of the dialogue that my work now is. They're really influencing the work that I do. And they're making it possible for, for me to be here today. So that's what Patreon's about. I'm a, I'm a, Great. I'm a believer in Patreon. I think it's liberating a lot of people to do independent activism and education. It's a wonderful platform, and I think the more we can work from home, you know, the the the, the easier we're going to be on the planet as well in terms of not having to commute, not having to work in industries that we don't philosophically believe in, and and all the rest of that. So that's great. So it's a Patreon. Um, art of animal liberation and so your work then is you're you were speaking um, and then I see you're writing you wrote an article was it counterpunch and are, are you writing elsewhere are you writing another book that sort of thing uh, I'm doing I'm doing slideshows with the patrons so we just did vegan 101 now we're gonna work on vegan 201 uh, vegan 101 was just a general introduction to veganism and I can share that with you in case you want to put it on up uh, on your YouTube channel or as a as a reference. It was fun, and it's it's nice that we have the studio because it allows us to do work that we can share for for free to make accessible to everybody. Um, so yeah, the the next one, Vegan Two Hundred One, is going to be out about the uh, UN Sustainability Goals. There are seventeen. UN sustainability goals. So it's going to be taking those sustainability goals one by one, all 17 of them, and discussing what veganism says to each one of those goals. So very excited about that. Uh, I was doing speaking every month. We had the pandemic. It's not happening. So there's a lot of things like what we're doing right now, which is great. Um, it's local, you know, I mean, we're, you're, we're miles away, but we're, we're local here, uh, sitting right where we are on our patios and our offices. So, uh, yeah, I'm writing for Counterpunch, and the latest piece is called Wet Markets and Wild Longings. So it's, that'd be easy to find on Counterpunch. And, yeah, trying to find alternative ways to get the word out and do vegan advocacy and outreach without necessarily having to be somewhere in person is a challenge and that's a really good challenge. I do hope 
that in July, we will have Vegan Summerfest at John, in, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I bought the Amtrak train tickets back in January. So uh, I do hope for that reunion. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, it's wonderful to be surrounded by people who are just not letting up, who are just ex excited about getting the word out about becoming a, a helping at, uh, humanity reach its potential. I think that's what I'm trying to do. I think that's what you're doing, and I appreciate being a part of it. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. It's been it's really great to see you again. And and so um, I'm just curious then for the art of animal liberation on Patreon. It's, this sounds like a place for all sorts of different vegans, maybe people who are new and people who want to just deepen their uh, understanding. Yes. Now, are you talking about as far as actually become, uh, uh, getting involved with the studio for the animal, art of animal liberation? Or are you talking about vegan creators also setting up studios? Because both of those things can happen. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so I support other creators. Uh, uh, right now, what comes to mind, who comes to mind immediately, uh, Vance Lemkul does, is, a, is on Patreon and does Philadelphia tours of the history of the whole vegetarian history and, and how it how it really took off in uh, Philadelphia, which Vance uh, shows and, and the, new, the, the, the the surrounding area, you know, this our, our surrounding area, which uh, Vance talks about the founding of the American Vegan Society and how so much arose here. So the historical uh, tours, actual uh, actual tours uh, around Philadelphia and, and surrounding areas. Uh, Marla Rose, who does memes and does uh, Vegan Street, is also on. Uh, there are so many people on um, that. Uh, uh, Honey LeBronx, uh, who is a a performance artist, um, drag drag queen, and yeah, just so many people who are vegans who are doing such a diverse range of vegan outreach vegan activism so why don't we support each other it's a okay. great network for for supporting a it's, supportive a, community. it's a great community to be a part of and and we welcome new members all the time we're, we're mo most welcome here in in the vegan world okay so thank you for taking the time today do you want to say anything as we as we close did we miss anything uh, i'm curious are you on patreon today I'm just actually setting something up. Um, it seems like, you know, I did radio for all of those years. And um, when I got a, a job um, that where I had to be somewhere five days a week, I was no longer able to do the radio. But now that I have this spare time, um, I, you know, we all have to fill our time in some way. And I, and, and we, I think we all, most of us want to contribute something to the world. It's not that we're just accepting government handouts and watching Netflix all day. I mean, that's fine for a day or two, but it gets kind of old after, you know, quickly and we want to contribute back. So I'm a big fan of the universal basic income. I'm very grateful to the Canadian government for the way they're handling this. I'm quite surprised that I like Pierre Trudeau all of a sudden. Um, for the way that he's handling this. And I, and I, so I just want to say, you know, I'm not, I'm trying not to waste my time, I'm trying to contribute and give something back. And so I don't know where it's going to go or what's going to be next, but I, uh, yeah, I just set up a Patreon. Just we'll see where this all leads. Well, I'm excited and uh, I'm looking forward to supporting it. Oh, that, that's awesome. I mean, it's, um, that, you know, there's, it would be wonderful to be able to get into a situation where, you know, we can, like you say, support each other. And because the flow of money really is what keeps the economy going. And I think the universal basic income is a very smart thing to do because it means that there's, there's five or six vegan restaurants in town who are staying alive through this, not with restaurant uh, people going in, but with takeout, which actually brings me to something that came up the other day, Lee, is... You know, while we're all staying home and um, not driving as much, perhaps, but a lot, a lot of people are still going to takeout. And there's, and you know, and now you can't bring your grocery bags into the grocery store, oh, to pack your own, yeah. like that sort of thing. There's, a, there's sort of this 
other thing that's happening and people are using gloves and then throwing them away and I'm I'm trying to catch them and say you know what you can wash those with soap they're just plastic right Right. so yeah always a challenge isn't it yeah it's always something um when you're a physical being on a on a planet (laughs) but we we do the best we can I suppose and so uh, it looks like you're in a beautiful place for your self-isolation. And, and thanks again for taking this time today. And we'll send people over to your Patreon, Lee Hall. Thank you, Lee. Sweet. Great, great to be with you. Much love to you.